Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 436, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today is September 14th, 2018. Okay, welcome back to the program. Uh, George, how you been feeling? I'm getting better. Got uh, some exciting uh, medical tests planned for next week, but I go to work again on Monday. I'm looking forward to it tremendously. And, and so are most of the people who you text all the time. Because when, when you work, I never hear from you. In fact, I'll say, you know, George, we're taping today. Cricket, cricket, no, nothing. George, George, hello, George, 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 George. And you'll finally respond because you're a busy priest. Uh, you certainly do the journalism job, but you run a very successful parish uh, in Florida. So uh, I, I bet you're pretty excited to get back. Yes, I am. It's the beginning of the fall season. I've got uh, a sermon series outlined and teaching classes and all the excitement. And uh, I'm bored to tears, Kevin. But you are. I am so bored. <laughs> Kevin Fever. Well, it, and, it, it's and an the answer thing is to that prayer. It's, but it's not like I'm having a wonderful uh, a break from work. It's just I, I'm bored because my brain is working, but my body isn't. You're not doing 18 rounds and there's, of golf, I understand. And, and there are only so many episodes of these home and garden TV shows I can watch, and they repeat the mad nauseum. Yes, they do. I mean... And I found myself sitting down in the den with my wife watching Say Yes to the Dress last night, and I knew something had to give. Yes. And well, you can't be too far. you got two uh, daughters graduated college. Um, my daughter's getting married next June, so you can't be too far behind that. Kevin, hmm? huh? where do people get the money for these things? I just don't know. $6,000. I know. Uh, oh, we'll we'll have the the dress discussion some other time. Uh, let's move on to the news. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Bishop Biker's health? Uh, before we do that, I, back in two thousand seven or two thousand eight, I was at an ACN event. It, it was Anglican Communion Network. What was it called? Yeah. Yes. Uh, somewhere Pre precursor to the ACNA. Down in Fort Worth, and I was at a meeting. There's a whole bunch of bishops down there. And uh, there was an announcement. Somebody said, I just heard that uh, uh, Bishop Bruno has cancer. And one of the first people to stand up and said, we need to pray for Bishop Bruno, it was Bishop Biker. And so he gathered all these bishops together to pray for him. I was like, wow. You know, with all the wars going on and all the words and fighting and uh, conflicts and politics going back and forth, the, the first response from Bishop Biker was to pray for, for Bishop Bruno. Well, Bishop Iker needs our prayers because he found a, uh, they've, doctors found a mass in his chest that needs to be operated on. They, they assume it's cancerous. And, you know, he just announced a couple weeks ago he wanted to retire in 2019. So do lift him up sometime today in your prayers. And uh, we really appreciate that here at Anglican Unscripted. George, let's move on to some international news. Um, if this news came out 10 years ago, everybody would be talking about it but because it's so behind the times and it just seems the way the communion is going the announcement that the uh, uh, the church in Wales is going to find a way to have gay marriage isn't really news anymore George no and it's almost what uh, almost of a reaction of what took you so long yeah the church in Wales is well, it's a it's a good it's a close race between the Scottish Episcopal Church and the Church in Wales for, and the Brazilian Church for the least healthy Anglican churches in the world, mm -hmm. in terms of growth and membership and viability. These these churches are drowning fast, and it's probably no. It, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but these are the three that have led the charge on gay marriage along with the Episcopal Church. Church in Wales is uh, uh, synod met this past week and they endorsed a plan by the bishops to uh, begin the process towards a pastoral support for gay marriage but at the same time they're not going to change the doctrine of marriage in the prayer book they're just going to change it how they actually do it so the, the so, canons won't change the prayer book won't change the bylaws and you know byways of the church won't do it but somehow they're going to have an executive order of some sort to allow for gay marriage? Well, they'll probably change a word here or there, but they're not going to change the teaching documents 
except they're going to change the liturgy mm -hmm. so that the liturgy no longer matches the teaching, which no, which will no longer match the Bible. But I don't think that's a consideration in no, these issues. Not a big deal. But but I think Kevin, I think what is there is a, there is a small fervent uh, conservative element in the church in Wales, but the way that that church is operated, specifically specifically under its, the former Archbishop Barry Morgan, is to demonize people. I mean, if you don't think the way we do, you are evil or mentally deluded. Mm -hmm. And though it's not that bad anymore under its current Archbishop. It's just a really dreadful environment for traditionalists in that province. And I think the sad thing is, is that the uh, uh, AMIE and other conservative elements in England have not really been able to make inroads in Wales. And so that these poor Welsh traditionalists really are on their own. They're stuck in the valley and they just don't want to come out uh, raise their heads above the ridge because they're going to get their head chopped off. It's amazing how over the last generation, the default position uh, has changed, not just within the church, but within society. Uh, gay marriage was accepted nowhere 25 years ago. Uh, maybe, you know, some island somewhere, but it wasn't even in the thought or our conscience. And all of a sudden, not through you know, legalese, but through decisions at judicial levels around the world, uh, it's now become a norm. The press has picked up on it and made it a norm so that if you do not agree with it, uh, do not endorse it, do not participate in it, you're demonized. And it's mm -hmm. not just within the church. Um, it's, it's our complete society. It's pretty sad. Well, it's the world in which we live. But, uh, Kevin, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the church in Wales is has done? And the answer is no. Because we've reached the point that it's no longer shocking because, you know, as you said, we, this is just, it, it matches the culture. So the church, far from being countercultural, is a firm ally of the prevailing culture. So it's not shocking and it really doesn't impact faithful Christians elsewhere. The impact really is on those trapped in structures within the church in Wales. Well, I, I think I, I don't completely agree there's not, you know, a, a consequence to this. I think, you know, in the Middle East and uh, other places, there is a consequence to what the larger church does uh, in the Anglican Communion. We certainly have that famous statement that, you know, what the Episcopal Church is going to do is going to tear at the fabric of the Communion. Well, what Wales does can't tear at the fabric because it's already torn. You know, the Anglican Communion is already broken. Uh, the people in charge of the Communion don't care and aren't going to find a way forward. They just want us to work together, talk together, and play together. And that's the future. I want to move on and talk But it, Kevin, it's yeah. real, I, I, I'm just going to push you on sure. this. Sure, go ahead. Demography is destiny, mm -hmm. people like to say. And within a generation, the church in Wales will be gone. Just, you know, the last, I mean, it's even un it is l even less healthy than the Church of England. The Church of England has got twenty years to pull out of the nosedive. Uh, ten Church, years. In yeah. Church in Wales has even less time. Mm -hmm. And there, as you mentioned in your story with Kevin yesterday, it is a fertile mission field it is. because the institutions have failed, but the faith is still there. So whether we like it or you know whether. Whether Franklin Graham is not going to Wales, but he's going up close to the Welsh border in Black, uh, Blackburn area, and whether this, there's the start of revival in Wales and in England that can change that nation, I pray that this is the beginning. But right now, this is a this is this is a this is a dead church. It's a it's a post-Christian church in a post-Christian world. And not all of its members are. No, but we're, I'm not speaking all. Of the institution. we're speaking of the, the leadership in the institution. Um, it's sad. Uh, I, let's talk about a place that is also very fertile ground um, and has a vibrant underground church uh, that's persecuted. And I'm speaking of China. 
Uh, the oh, I Ch- thought you meant what we're going to say, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> the vibrant underground of L.A. No, uh, China's uh, really started to persecute anybody of faith, anybody who does not uh, worship the leadership in China, uh, certainly the president of China. And uh, they, I, a lot of people, and I remember the smirks and stuff on Facebook, when they started putting Muslims in internment camps where they were doing re-education, a lot of people said, well, they're Muslims, they're Islamic, we don't really care. Well, now it's really starting to take effect with the Christians are really being bombarded. Their buildings are burnt down. Uh, those who uh, oppose any change are being jailed. Uh, it's really becoming a prison for Christians in China. And I thought you and I could talk about it. Actually, Kevin, it started, of all things, with Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. Now, for you and me in America, Tai Chi is what old ladies do at the YMCA. You know, it's it's that, uh, you know, series of... My wife does it on Tuesday afternoons at our local YMCA. It helps movement and exercise and this and that. It comes out of China, and there's a theological, philosophical bent to it. Tai Chi has been harshly, harshly persecuted by the Chinese communist regime Mm -hmm. and followed by the Christians, then the Muslims out in the West, now the Taoists and And Buddhists. Buddhists, And we're seeing press reports that the level of persecution is is now greater than it was in the late 60s during the Cultural Revolution. Children are no longer allowed to go to church. Teachers must sign statements saying that they do not attend a church and they renounce Christian faith if they want a job teaching. Um, Christian churches are being shut down and when I'm saying shut down I mean the police come with a bulldozer and knock it down and priests and and ministers are uh, and lay leaders are taken away and disappear into the Chinese gulag. It's a really bad situation Yet at the same time, the fastest growing church in the world is in China. Mm-hmm. And, and I think China's try, trying to stop as best as it, it's again this revival going on in China. Yeah, it's interesting. You, this is almost pre Nixon China. The, the crackdown. In, in some in some well, China really hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, if you sort of step back and think about this philosophically. In 1948, when Mao Zedong marched into uh, Peking, there were half a million Christians in all of China. And the Christian church started coming under pressure within four or five years. And by the 60s, you know, Mao and Madame Mao, his, his wife, were basically saying the church is gone. Mm-hmm. Now, latest estimates before this latest crackdown is that there could be up to 100 million Chinese Christians which means there are more Christians than there are Communist Party members. The, Ch- the Communist Party had to issue a, an order saying that you may not be remain a member of the Communist Party if you're a Christian. So what's happening? It's a threat to the power of the party. So any threats to the party are ruthlessly, ruthlessly stamped down. So you can be a billionaire, you can make money, I mean, you can have all the cash you want but so long as you pass your cut to the party and are loyal to the party they leave you alone they really do but if you're but if you're a poor peasant who believes in jesus christ or a minister in some village you will be arrested your children taken from you and you will be sent off for re-education and possibly death i think one of the biggest changes uh, to communism now is uh, they've adopted hyper capitalism you know, they'll take your money, they'll develop your products, they'll uh, provide manufacturing systems for uh, the iPhone and all that uh, to to bring money to the economy. But the other part of communism is alive and well. And, you know, the secret police, the uh, multi-party system, uh, it's alive and well in, in communist China. What, and, I, what I think is really amusing is that you know, Justin Well be going off on this tirade about how socialism is, social, socialism is the way forward. Where are the sweatshops that Nike uses in communist Vietnam? Yes. Where are the labor problems of sweatshops and uh, people living hand to mouth because of the state? They're in China in these socialist communist regimes. Justin, you really got to 
crack open a book, you know, things have changed since you were in college. You could Google this, Justin. Well, let's move on and talk about uh, Justin for a minute. Uh, Gab and I talked a lot about uh, Justin and uh, how he's doing it wrong in, in yesterday's show, 435. But the, he came on and said Amazon is evil, zero contracts are evil, and gave his list of evils. And he gave a list of evils like three or four years ago, uh, payday loans. And all five took, years ago. Five, five years, years ago. And all you have to do is type Church of England payday loans, and you find out they invest in payday loan lenders. All you have to do is Google it, and you find out that the Church of England is a heavy investor, like myself, in Amazon. And you're like, uh, what does it take to get through to Justin? I don't understand. Well, Justin Welby gave a uh, an interview, and then he gave a speech to the Trade Union Council, TUC, in England, where he denounced by name Amazon as a corrupt, evil capitalist predator. He denounced, uh, they call them zero, uh, what are the zero, zero hour? Zero day or zero contract. Zero contracts in England. Yeah. In America, we have them everywhere. It's, you know, part-time job, no benefits, you know, per diem labor. And... He denounced all these as terrible. And then the press, thank goodness, the press is starting to wake up. The next day, the Church Times, the Church Times, which has been carrying Justin's water for years, published a report saying the church commissioners who manage the Church of England's investments, one of their major holdings is an Amazon, and the church commissioners are not going to sell. And then the, the secular press followed suit, and they had these reports about Norwich Cathedral and Gloucester Cathedral, and these major cathedrals who right now, if you look in the one ads, are advertising zero-hour contract uh, employment jobs. So the, the, there's, the, there's a tie. Not also, Justin Welby is made to look like a fool once more. Five years ago, he said, we, payday loans are evil. The Church of England is an investor in payday loans. Last this week, Amazon is evil. The Church of England is a major investor. Is Amazon, and but nowadays the press, they think he's a buffoon. Well, they, and, he, he's he, past the seriousness level. He has, and you're right. I mean, uh, the press, the New York Times has always been all in for uh, Obama, and they they help support Obama. Uh, so did the Washington Post all through his eight years here. They're not all in for Trump at all, but that's you know, no yeah, kind of different story. Different story. Um, so Justin has lost his supporting press over in England. One of the big things I, as a capitalist, say is, you know, don't be so quick to call what you think is evil evil. It didn't take, but uh, I think it was the same day that it was announced. Uh, Justin Welby thought Amazon was evil. Amazon donated two billion dollars to start up. Uh, preschools for homeless people uh, and to start investing in homeless shelters and stuff like that. Now, the whole world would love if uh, the government took that money from Jeff and started the preschools, if took the money from Jeff Bezos and Amazon to start uh, homeless shelters, but to have Jeff do it on his own as a philanthropist, ugh, I can't even say it, philanthropist, they hate that. They'd rather have the government take the money. Well, the government may do something because we're reading that the attorney general and about 25 states attorneys generals are having a meeting to discuss whether to proceed against Google and Facebook and Apple and maybe Amazon, I'm not certain if they're on the list, for antitrust violations, sure. to break up the companies like they broke up the telephone company 25 years ago. So. I don't know, Kevin. You're the stock picker. Is it time to sell Amazon? Or? Oh, don't sell or Amazon. Because just... Amazon's not cooped. Amazon is now going into the prescription market. And uh, there's going to be a lot of money to make and uh, add to the stocks. I think the biggest problem is the social influence. So places like Google, Facebook, Netflix. Uh, I searched for a movie on Netflix that was related to another movie that related to another movie and all of a sudden i have uh you know recommended movies on facebook have nothing to do with what i was looking for but had to do with their social agenda and i'm like you know something's not right here uh facebook is the same way you only see what facebook wants you to see google is the same way and google i don't know if you guys remember this back in 2016 if you went to google and you typed uh 
Trump uh, fraud and it had an auto fill feature, it would tell you all the frauds Google thought he was guilty of. If you typed Hillary fraud, it would come up with no auto fill whatsoever. Uh, Yahoo uh, would do the auto fill, but um, there's just a desire within uh, these communities, these high tech communities, to be the default conscience for the world. And they feel the default is liberal, the default is pro gay, pro gay marriage, pro, uh, you know, socialism, semi communism, and they will protect the default. So we'll have to see what happens. You know, I don't want Anglican Unscripted to be this big political program, but when Archbishop Welby goes up there and starts attacking things that he clearly knows nothing about, uh, it's our job to point it out. And if we have other facts to back it up, we'll do that. Well, what we need to say is that though it is far from perfect, the capitalist system has brought more people out of poverty than any other mechanism. It's certainly more than any state uh, program has. Yeah, by uh, a factor of thousands. You know, it's it's not it's not a close game. You know, it's not. Oh, they capitalism is kind of better. Capitalism is corrupt. It is horrible. It has many flaws. It's not perfect. Yet it is the best thing we got. Well, it's yeah. the same thing as Winston Churchill said about democracy. It's a terrible system, but it's the best one we have. It's the best one we got. You know, until the, the, the kingdom of heaven replaces the kingdom of earth, uh, capitalism works. And uh, China has adopted hypercapitalism. Uh, Russia has an underground capitalism uh, because it works. Now, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens here uh, in North America down the road as the socialist agendas are starting to take a, a strong foothold. We'll see. George. We have blown past our 17 minutes, not by too much. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 436 of Anglican Unscript. And we're not done yet. I'm here to talk to you about the benefits of being an active viewer on the show. Normally I talk about this first, or I should at least. If you liked our episode, click the like button somewhere, someplace. On some page, Facebook or YouTube, there's a thumbs up. Click it. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I have not seen a lot of this, and I can monitor who's sharing what. You guys aren't sharing the program yet. And I forgot something very important, too. Oh. And I'm going to hold it up, and I want you to tell folks what I'm talking oh, about. There is a new book out there. It's written by a genius, uh, about a genius. And it's written at a genius level. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, love music or not, but uh, Alan Haley has written uh, just a, a wonderful tome uh, about Beethoven. Let me write, read to you part of the back. Right. I started reading it last night, and uh, this book documents the little-known story of how Beethoven drew inspiration from Prometheus' example. Transforming the music he wrote for the ballet, he summoned his deafness he surmounted his deafness, broke free the classical mode, and composed the Eroica Symphony, a masterpiece which changed the course of music forever. Alan is a musicologist, is in addition to being an attorney. <laughs> and a commentator. And, and, and I have to say, Kevin is right. This book is written by a genius, about a genius, and it helps be genius to read it because the argument, I'm, I'm not going to review it because Alan will hate me for the rest of his life saying, how could you be sublime? How did you miss the sense? point of the book? Yes. <laughs> but if you are a classical music devotee, if you enjoy this uh, topic, I strongly urge you to go on to Amazon. I'll put the link in the show notes. And, and it's Beethoven Unbound, the story of the Eroica. Alan started working on this when he was at Harvard 50 years ago, uh, whenever he was at Harvard. Well, this is undergrad. this is Alan's and opus. he finally you know. turned in the paper all these years later. Right. I don't know if he <laughs> No, this is Alan Haley's opus, you know, and uh, uh, well done, and uh, hope you get a chance to read it. Uh, if you, you need, like, show uh, book notes, you'll have to talk to Alan about that. Oh, and I please subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. And for those highly intellectual people, who don't go on Facebook, who don't go on YouTube, we do have a podcast available. It's in the show notes on YouTube. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you have still been watching episode 436 of Anglican Unscripted.